Northern Ireland. A small step to a giant adventure. Book your next giant adventure at discovernorthernireland.com. Welcome to this talk for Felion Fubble 2021 on the theme of Irish liberty and the slave trade from Swift to Burke. My name is Amy McBride. I'm Professor of Irish History at the University of Oxford, where we have eight historians working on different aspects of Irish history. My field is the 18th century. That's the century of the Protestant ascendancy, the penal laws, the United Irishmen, and the 1798 rebellion. All these uh, subjects have fascinated me for many years. About 10 years ago, I wrote a general history of 18th century Ireland, and I gave it the title, The Isle of Slaves. Some of you might know, that's a quotation from Jonathan Swift, whose Irish writings were full of references to the Irish as slaves and to um, Ireland under British rule as existing in a state of slavery. Now, it comes as something of a shock, I think, to modern readers to realize that when Swift spoke of Irish slaves, he wasn't talking about the ordinary people. He wasn't talking about the Catholic majority for whom, as it happens, he had a lot of sympathy. He was talking about people like himself, members of a very small privileged uh, elite, ruling elite, uh, whom he thought were disadvantaged by English policies. Uh, so that's an irony. Um, uh, about that title, but I think 10 years ago, I was um, aware that there is, of course, another irony, and this has become um, much a much more pressing subject in the light of the Black Lives Matter movement and associated protests, and that's that the 18th century was also the era of real slavery, that is the era when the slave trade across the Atlantic um, reached its height. And Swift, um, as we'll see, was implicated uh, in that um, historical process. Um, now, um, there you go. Um, I'm going to show you some slides while I'm talking. This one um, is actually the Marie Seraphique. Um, it's the only design that we know of, contemporary design for a, a slave ship, in this case, um, a French uh, slave ship. So that's my theme. Um, during the 18th century, talk of slavery was pervasive in England, Scotland, Ireland, the North American colonies. The English routinely congratulated themselves on the revolution of 1688, which they believed had delivered their forefathers uh, from popery and slavery, as they put it. But the contrast between English liberty and French slavery was an article of faith, not just for defenders of the establishment, but for oppositional figures too, for the most radical voices of that um, era. But what was the relationship between the rhetoric of slavery and the brutal physical realities of the transatlantic slave trade? Between 1660 and 1807, the British Empire transported more than 3.4 million enslaved Africans to America, as many as all the other slave trading nations put together. And the Irish, Protestants, Catholics and dissenters played an important part um, in that process as slave, owner, slave holders and settlers in the Caribbean, as investors in plantations, as uh, merchants and manufacturers um, in Ireland trading with the Caribbean. The economic growth of Galway, Cork, Limerick, Dublin and Belfast was to varying degrees built upon trade with the sugar plantations. Now, until recently, few historians have addressed this paradox. Uh, the paradox, that is, that these vigorous boasts of um, English liberty peaked at precisely the same time as Britain's role in the transatlantic slave trade. But there's one exception. And that's um, scholars working on the political writings of John Locke. Um, now, Locke, of course, most famous for the two treatises, um, which is seen as, as really the foundational text of the Western liberal tradition, hugely um, influential in North America, 
um, as well as in Britain and in Ireland. And um, the, the page you can see on the right is from Robert Emmett's copy of the two treatises. And as you can see, he found a lot um, there to um, scribble about in the margin. Now, in the two treatises, Locke famously proclaimed that slavery was so vile and miserable uh, a condition that no Englishman would defend it. Um, but while Locke was working on the two treatises, he was also revising the fundamental constitutions of Carolina. That is, he drew up the constitution for the colony of Carolina. And in it, the power of the free man over his Negro slaves, um, the term that he used, is described as absolute. It can't have escaped Locke's notice that the American situation was in direct conflict with the doctrine that he was putting forward in his two treatises on government. Few English men were so well informed about English colonialism in North America as Locke. But with only one brief exception, the Carolinas and uh, the Caribbean are completely absent from the two treatises. When Locke gives examples of those who have been unjustly um, enslaved, unjustly conquered, it's the Anglo-Saxons under the Danes or the Greek Christians under the Turks. At no point in his chapters of slavery um, or of conquest does he raise his eyes across the Atlantic. Locke um, doesn't deviate from his target and his target was the absolute power sought by Stuart kings, that is the English monarchs like Charles II and his Catholic brother James II, and already enjoyed by their cousin Louis XIV of France. Now in this talk, um, I'm going to turn from English liberty and from Locke to Irish liberty, liberty or at least Irish advocates of liberty in the hope of further illuminating um, the contradiction that I've just been um, describing, the contradiction that's manifested so starkly in Locke's writings. And I've got um, three case studies. <clears throat> um, and here they are in chronological order, I suppose. Um, first of all, Jonathan Swift. Um, well, um, the author of Gulliver's Travels, which is these days read as an anti-colonial work because um, Gulliver's four um, uh, topsy-turvy journeys culminate in a spectacular denunciation of British imperialism um, at the very end of that book. Um, Swift, of course, also famous for his Draper's Letters, um, an attack on Wood's halfpence and British misgovernment in Ireland in the 1720s. He mobilized Irish public opinion against the British government and inflicted on it a very, very rare and humiliating defeat. And it was the Draper's letters and that victory that earned him the, the title, the Hibernian Patriot. At the other end of the century um, is Edmund Burke, um, seen here on the right, best known for his reflections of the revolution in France, regarded as the, the founder of uh, English conservatism uh, by many. But Burke's um, family roots were in Catholic Ireland. Um, and Burke in the second half of the 18th century was by far the most influential um, exponent of uh, Catholic emancipation, of lifting the penal laws um, uh, on Irish Catholics. But before grappling with Swift and Burke, it's the figure in the middle that I want to address, and that's the Ulster Scots philosopher Francis Hutcheson, uh, born near Saintfield, um, taught in at a dissenting, that is Presbyterian Academy in Dublin in the 1720s, before taking up a chair in moral philosophy at the University of Glasgow. Um, Hutcheson, um, we see increasingly, I think, as a hugely important figure in the history of Enlightenment thought, as someone who influenced um, two generations of American Presbyterians in um, the decades before and after American independence, and also as someone who um, influenced a generation of Irish Presbyterian ministers um, who were political leaders in Ireland as well as uh, religious leaders. 
And I'm um, interested in Hutchison particularly because he provides a forceful example of a, a general lesson, I think, about how we should approach the past. And I hope I'll be able to explain what I mean. Because Hutchison illustrates um, how it's only by careful attention to context that we can understand the distinctive features of 18th century views on slavery, um, that we can measure the originality of any particular writer. So there you go, that's my three case studies. They're all incidentally held up as opponents of imperialism. I, I mean, very prominent opponents of imperialism. Swift because of Gulliver's travels. Hutchison because he defended the right of colonies to resist their mother country. Um, and was influential, as I said, in the run up to the American Revolution. And Burke, above all, for his passionate denunciation of British misrule in India um, in the 1780s and 90s. <clears throat> so, um, case study number one <coughs> then is Francis Hutchison. Now, ever since David Brian Davis's pioneering book, the Problem of Slavery, which appeared in the 60s, Hutchison has been ranked, along with Montesquieu, the French Enlightenment thinker, as one of the philosophical founders of the anti-slavery cause. And the reason is the enormous prestige attached to these two uh, works. The short introduction to moral philosophy and the system of moral philosophy they were written um, in the 1730s, <coughs> excuse me, but not published, as you can see, until 1742 and 55. Above all, um, Hutchison is important because his name was frequently invoked by the Quaker activist, Anthony Benizet, um, a really important figure in the abolitionist movement in the American colonies. Now, recently, it's true, some scholars have um, doubted Hutchison's commitment to the campaign against slavery um, and suggested that really his um, uh, devotion to the rights of property inhibited his support for the anti-slavery um, cause. Um, but there's never been a detailed examination of his ideas. And that's what I'm going to do very, very quickly now. So to make sense, of Hutchison's views, I think you have to begin by appreciating that these two books, The Short Introduction and The System, were textbooks taught by a professor in a university classroom. They were consciously part of a specifically Protestant natural rights tradition. So the theory of natural rights is an important strand of European thought at this time. And natural rights theory, for our purposes, originated with um, this man, Puffendorf, Samuel Puffendorf, um, the author of De Officio Hominis et Civis, uh, The Duty of Man and the Citizen. And there you see um, the original text and Hutchison's system side by side. Puffendorf supplied the template um, for 18th century discussions of rights and duties. And university professors a number of them produced annotated editions of Puffendorf. So you began um, by teaching Puffendorf, you then elaborated, discussed questions, various, po of per various points in it, and you ended up producing your own reworked edition of that book. That's what Hutchison's predecessor at Glasgow did, a man named Gershom Carmichael, and he published his own commentary in 1718 and he called it Supplementis et Observationibus in Academica Juventus Usum Glasgowi. We're going to call it Supplements. Um, but note um, that when you move from Hutchison's predecessor to Hutchison himself, you move from a world of Latin to a world of English. Hutchison was the first of the Scottish Enlightenment professors to lecture in the classroom in English. And of course, he wrote in English. <clears throat> Now, when Hutchison um, arrived at Glasgow in 1730, he began by teaching Carmichael's supplements. And his uh, own textbooks then were an attempt over many years to rewrite Puffendorf, to rewrite his predecessor's um, book, to accommodate the new philosophical ideas that had made Hutchison famous 
um, while he taught in Dublin in the 1720s. Now there were three, um, in this tradition, there were three theoretical bases for slavery, three ways in which you could justify slavery. And they were all examined within this natural rights framework. There was first of all the argument from natural inferiority, which went back to Aristotle. Then there was the argument from conquest, that is that uh, losers in a war might forfeit, forfeit their freedom. And then there was the position of the hereditary slave, someone who was born into slavery. Now, American historians have generally stressed the first of these, Hutchison's rebuttal of Aristotle's views on slavery. But this was actually an absolutely standard element of Protestant natural rights thought. Both Hutchison's books contain sections entitled The Natural Equality of Men, and both uh, attacked Aristotle. They dismissed the views of Aristotle as um, just the, the ethnic prejudice of the Greeks concerning the allegedly bar barbarous peoples who they thought they were entitled to rule. So I'm not gonna spend time on that because as I say, it was the least innovative aspect, even though that's what most historians have stressed. The second um, basis for the legitimate enslavement um, of human beings derived from the rights of war. Men were certainly born free, but some could be reduced to servitude as a less severe punishment than death. So if I uh, defeat you in warfare, which means incidentally that uh, I was fighting a just war because um, God allowed me to win. If I defeat you in warfare, um, it's I'm doing you a favor by preserving your life. I'm a merciful kind of person. So I've decided I'm not gonna kill you, but instead I'm going to put you in slavery. I'm going to enjoy uh, your coerced labor for the rest of your life. Well, John Locke challenged that view um, in the two treatises and qualified the rights of the conqueror. So according to Locke, I can enslave you. I can't enslave your wife or your children or your descendants because they weren't actually fighting. And I can't take your property. Um, at least I, I can only take what I really need to compensate me for the effort involved in fighting. That was Locke's view, but Hutchison really multiplied um, the restrictions on the rights of the conqueror. He gives you a much more detailed consideration of how far a legislator, a voter, a taxpayer, or a soldier could be held responsible for making war. Um, Hutchison thought it was the rulers that were responsible for warfare not their ordinary subjects. After all, he said soldiers, a lot of soldiers, they're forced to fight, they've got no alternative. Taxpayers are not paying tax specifically to fight war. They're not allowed to withhold their tax. If you're going to enslave someone, Hutchison suggests, it's the presidents and the prime ministers who deserve to be put in slavery, not their subjects. There's also a note of distaste um, that you don't find um, in Locke's two treatises that you do find in Hutchison. Hutchison protests that no crime, as he puts it, can change a rational creature into a piece of goods. The third argument um, that could be used to justify slavery, I'm calling the argument from maintenance. This is the position of the hereditary slave. And according to Puffendorf, everybody accepted that the children of a slave belong, as he put it, as a piece of property to the owner of the mother. The logic here was that the body of the mother belonged to the slaveholder and the mother had no means of supporting her children by herself. Therefore, um, the, the owner has the, is, is entitled to the labor of the children also. Well, in the first place, Hutchison objects, Conquerors have no right to murder captives in cold blood. And refraining from doing so gives them no right to the labor of captives or their children. Even if it were morally acceptable to execute prisoners of war, their children were born innocent. And here, um, let's look at some of Hutchison's own words. <clears throat> 
They're born innocent since, as he put it, they are rational beings of our species, the workmanship of the same God in their bodies and their souls, of the same materials with ourselves and our children. Revealingly, it was the question of hereditary slavery that prompted the only clear contemporary references uh, made by Hutchison in his discussion of slavery, which is otherwise quite abstract. As I said, this is an academic um, philosopher talking. Hutchison expressed abhorrence at this argument that the maintenance of a child could be used to justify um, enslavement, as he put it, of innocent children, of, in, of captives in war, or of men of a different complexion along with their pos posterity, of course, as if he wrote, as if such were not of our species and had not bodies and souls of the same feelings with our own. The secular rights of men, Hutchison warned, were altered neither by their religious creed nor by their skin color. So I'm trying to um, show then that um, Hutchison, and this is true of other writers in the 18th century, were in conversation with their predecessors and the people of their own time. And if you read Hutchison in that way, you'll see that at each point where he discusses the, the issue of slavery, he's expanding the criticism of it, expanding the attacks that have been made on it by other philosophers rather than limiting them. Now, let me just wrap up um, what I've got to say about Francis Hutchison by commenting on one argument that was unique to him Repeatedly, Hutchison contends that enslaved people retain the right of resistance to oppression, even if they've been um, put in slavery for just reasons. And as we've seen, um, there aren't many just reasons. <clears throat> the right of self-defense for Francis Hutchison was inalienable. It could not be given up. And it's worth um, quoting him here again. So Hutchison says of slaves, they have a right to defend themselves against any savage useless, that defend themselves by violence against any savage useless tortures, any attempts of maiming them or prostituting them to the lusts of their masters or forcing them in any worship against their consciences. Now, why mention torture, maiming, sexual exploitation, because all of these, of course, were subjects of the literature describing the conditions of slaves in the Caribbean at this time and beginning to be read in Britain and in Ireland. OK, so that's um, um, case study number one. Case study number two, then, is um, Jonathan Swift. Um, now, as we're moving slightly back in, in time, <clears throat> I said the words slaves and slavery permeate Swift's patriotic writings. His celebrated definition of slavery is announced um, in his letter to the whole people of Ireland, the fourth of his Draper's letters. When he says all government without the consent of the government is the very definition of slavery. And again, this would be a ringing declaration um, in uh, the American colonies in the 1760s and, and 1770s. It's not just important in Irish history. Of course, critics, um, I mean, literary critics and historians have always known that the same man hailed as the Hibernian Patriot in the 1720s had been in a previous incarnation, the most celebrated political writer in the London of Queen Anne's reign, the spin doctor, for the Tory government led by Robert Harley. Um, and advanced knowledge um, of the Asiento Clause in the Treaty of Utrecht, uh, 1713, enabled Swift um, to invest £500 in the South Sea Company. This was in January 1712, confident that its stock would rise when it acquired the exclusive right to export slaves to Spanish America. So Swift was the most um, vocal um, and um, celebrated um, advocate of the ministry that negotiated the Asiento, 
the contract to supply African slaves to Spanish America. Now, as with Locke, then, Swift reminds us of the disjunction between the vocabulary of liberty as it was applied on the one hand to European regimes and on the other to the forced labour of Negroes or Blacks, I use the contemporary terms, on the sugar plantations of the Caribbean. Well, confronted with the vehemence of Swift's polemic against England's enslavement of the Irish, and the almost total silence about the asiento. One scholar suggested that what we've got here is a kind of guilt transference, you know, a displaced or redirected anger. In other words, Swift was left um, with such a sense of discomfort about his role in the slave trade um, that here we have a psychological explanation for the emotional intensity for the fury of his um, campaign against the British government in Ireland. I, I can't find any evidence for that view and I'll try to explain why. To be free as subjects of the English monarchy were often told was to live under laws to which we have given our consent. To be dependent on the will of another by contrast was to be reduced to the condition of servitude. Shortly before the Westminster Parliament passed the Woolen Act of 1699, which um, crippled um, Ireland's uh, woolen industry, Archbishop William King of Dublin lamented that, I quote, if I shall be bound by laws to which I am no party, I shall reckon myself as much a slave as one of the Grand Seigneur's mutes. This was a reference to the subjects of the Ottoman uh, Sultan, um, regarded as one of the kind of paradigms of tyranny at this time. In his State of the Protestants, classic defense of the 1688 revolution, King, Archbishop William King, observed that under the, the constitution of England and Ireland, the liberties, properties, and lives of the subjects were secured only by the right to choose their own parliamentary representatives. Take this away, he warned, and this is a very famous text. Take this away, and they are as absolute slaves to the king's will and as miserable as the peasants in France. The French were the other um, paradigm case of a people living in slavery. <clears throat> now, in various formulations, this view was repeated by other Irish writers. Indeed, it became a kind of Irish mantra well before the appearance of the Draper. In 1704, Sir Richard Cox, the Tory Lord Chancellor of Ireland, explained that Irish poverty, he's writing to England, saying Irish poverty here is attributed to English legislative interference. And he wrote, "'Tis a very popular theme that tis the greatest form of slavery to be governed by laws made without our representatives." So what was happening here was not just uh, for Swift, but for many Irish writers, there's a principle crystallizing the definition of um, slavery. Um, it's a principle crystallizing. It had many roots. You could find something a little bit like it in John Locke's two treatises. You could find something a bit like it in the writings of classical Republicans, those who admired the ancient republics of Greece and Rome, like Machiavelli. You could find something a bit like it in the ideas that the English associated with their ancient constitution, with Magna Carta, and so on. But it crystallizes in Ireland because the Irish um, face a new um, problem in political thinking. That's the problem of a parliament outside your country, um, a different national parliament claiming jurisdiction over your own. So um, the first point um, I want to make then is that uh, the definition of slavery, although it's put most forcefully by Jonathan Swift, wasn't unique to him. And of course, it predated the Asiento. Um, it went back to the late 17th century. So far as we can tell, moreover, Swift was not troubled by Britain's growing share of the African trade. The total number of slaves um, ex exported in British ships rose markedly during his politically active life. It climbed from roughly 126,000 in the first decade of the 18th century 
to 276,000 in the 1720s. Between 1690 and 1714, the reigns of William and Anne roughly, from 1690 to 1714, the management of the African trade, as it was often um, called, took up more parliamentary time at Westminster than any other economic issue. It generated 206 petitions and almost 200 pamphlets, but it was debated as an economic question rather than a humanitarian one. In political discourse, slavery still meant subjection to the arbitrary or unregulated rule of um, a monarch who was consequently a tyrant and could be therefore rightly deposed. The ability to keep Europeans and Africans in separate mental um, compartments, however disturbing to modern readers, passed without comment. And accordingly, when Swift came to write his own history of the peace negotiations at Utrecht, the Asiento was mentioned only in passing, and the context was a side swipe aimed at Britain's loathsome allies, the Dutch. I, what I mean is Swift loathed them, and he loathed them because they reminded him too much of Ulster Presbyterians. Now, I don't mean to suggest that nobody <clears throat> ever thought about the injustices of the slave trade, <clears throat> or nobody ever voiced opposition to it in this period, the first half of the 18th century. In the correspondence of Archbishop King, who I've mentioned already, preserved in Trinity College Dublin, there's a passionate denunciation of the Asiento, which he called most villainous, in a letter he wrote in 1727. And King's important because King um, was Swift's Archbishop. He was a fellow patriot um, in Irish politics, and the two men had become increasingly close in the 1720s. They knew each other very well. For King, the profits of the Asiento depended, he wrote, on making slaves of mankind who have as good a title to liberty as ourselves. The number of white adult males in Barbados, King warned, had fallen to 5,000. Meanwhile, 100,000 black slaves had been imported. Um, and as he put it, they will surely in time cut their master's throats as they well deserve. Um, so there you go. It wasn't as if it was impossible um, to um, hold views like that. Um, but the Caribbean was something that was happening. Uh, the sugar plantations, the slave plantations were something that was happening far away. The difficulties to, to reconstruct an intellectual world in which African slavery was for most, most of the time a political irrelevance, because of course there was no movement for abolition at this time. Or at best, it was a moral outrage, as in the case of Archbishop King, that was nevertheless kept at a distance. Um, and King finished off that letter incidentally, uh, by saying, I cannot think of it, the Asiento, without horror, and in time it will ruin our plantations. There's also the sense that not only is the responsibility for this problem, you know, somewhere far off, but that part of the, the problem with it is it's bad for British imperialism. It's going to damage the colonies. So that's um, my case study number two. And finally, um, I want to move on to Edmund Burke slightly later <clears throat> in the 18th century, when indeed um, abolition um, does become a serious political option. Now, Burke's stance on the transatlantic slave trade is perhaps one of the most disappointing aspects of Richard Burke's formidably learned biography of 2015. So now the standard um, work, I think, um, on Edmund Burke's politics and political thought. The picture that emerges of Burke's writings and his speeches on slavery um, in that book is a uniformly progressive one. As early as the account of the European settlements in America, um, which appeared in 1757, we learn that Burke was a critic of Britain's involvement in the slave trade, which he characterized as more ferocious than its continental rivals in the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese. 
as MP for Bristol um, in the 1770s, we learn uh, that Burke's well-known opposition to the slave trade alienated his constituents. And incidentally, the best estimate of historians is that Bristol merchants shipped half a million enslaved Africans to America in this period. Although um, the document um, usually called Sketch of a Negro Code, which was drafted by Burke in 1780, was a plea for humanizing the condition of slaves rather than for emancipating them. Uh, Richard Burke's biography does not explore the limitations of that document. In a speech on the slave trade in May 1788, Burke declared himself in favor of abolition, as he put it on the principles of humanity and justice. In May 1789, responding to Wilberforce's resolutions against the slave trade, um, he argues that the transatlantic slavery was indefensible. In some, and that's the positive view, in some, this brief discussion tends to confirm Conor Cruz O'Brien's um, lapidary um, verdict in The Great Melody, his book of 1992. I quote, Burke hated slavery. But a less complacent reading of Burke's pronouncements on the African trade reveals a troubling record of equivocation. For a more balanced view of the writings and speeches, we can now turn to Peter Marshall's detailed exploration of Burke and the West Indies, which reconstructs in detail, incidentally, the rather inept attempts at self-advancement um, in the colonies of William Burke <clears throat> in Guadeloupe, um, William Burke was Edmund's kinsman and close friend, um, and Edmund's brother, Richard Burke, in uh, Grenada. Marshall's book contains chapters on Burke's relations with Bristol, his lobbying on behalf of co the Company of Merchants Trading with Africa, his response to abolition in Parliament. And in all this business, Marshall finds Burke was, I quote, an upholder of empires, he found it, and a would-be manager of imperial assets, rather than a critic of imperial abuses. As late as March 1788, Burke maintained that the idea of immediately abolishing the slave trade was extravagant and impracticable. It's true that he spoke three times in favour of complete abolition in 1788, 89 and 1791. But then came news of the slave revolt in Saint-Domingue, the modern day Haiti, um, the first great black revolution, um, which as he saw it, <clears throat> had applied the rights of man, the French doctrine uh, to the Caribbean and had opened Pandora's box. When the House of Commons voted on Wilberforce's motion for abolition, losing by 193 votes to 125, Burke was absent. While Burke was certainly an opponent of imperial policy in Ireland, America, and in India, he was a vigorous defender of the rights of imperial sovereignty. His opposition to imperial misrule, most obviously in India, clearly reflected his family background. It reflected the experiences of his family, particularly his mother's side of the family, of the penal system, um, the monster disturbances of the 1760s, um, a great wave of um, sectarian um, bitterness in the 1760s, and the hanging of Father Nicholas Sheehy, 1766, and the whole domineering mindset of Protestant ascendancy, all of which sensitized Edmund Burke to problems of governance in what we today perhaps might call a deeply divided society. His fascination with empire building was already taking shape when he wrote in collaboration with William Burke, his kinsman, uh, this uh, book, an account of the European settlements in America, which was translated into um, French and other languages very widely read in the second half of the 18th century. Well, <clears throat> the account is an unembarrassed expression of Edmund Burke's commitment to European expansion. Insofar as the Burkes were able to conceive of an alternative future for the Caribbean, 
outside the British Empire, it was as part of the rival empire of France. The pursuit of geopolitical advantage for Britain was a frankly stated goal. Of course, the Burks claimed that empire could work not only for the colonizer, but also for the colonized. In practice, this meant extending the Christian religion, always perceived by Edmund Burke in terms of its social functions, rather than a, a, in sort of, um, a sort of a spiritual awakening um, that excited the evangelicals of that age. In other words, Christianity would make um, slaves more submissive. <coughs> Excuse me. That was why the Burke singled out as particularly uh, praiseworthy the Spanish Jesuits who worked, I quote, to bring the Indians and blacks into some knowledge of religion. In their treatment of French colonies, they recommended the Cod Noir, the French legal code that regulated slavery, because it offered some protection to the Negroes, as they put it, from the viciousness of slave owners, while simultaneously avoiding too much leniency. The French had apparently achieved what they called a sensible mixture of humanity and steadiness. A contrast with the English settlements where slaves were entirely abandoned body and soul to the whim of the planter. And body and soul, of course, because the French masters instructed their slaves or were required to instruct their slaves in the principles of religion. Whereas, at least according to Burke, um, uh, England's colonists um, failed to do this. <clears throat> and I'll just before um, uh, moving on, I'll just briefly look at this as the most frequently quoted passage from this work. Um, quoted usually to emphasize Burke's progressive views because he says here, one cannot hear without horror of a trade which must depend for its support upon the annual murder of thousands, several thousands of innocent men. But Burke goes on to say, indeed nothing could excuse the slave trade at all, but the necessity we are under of peopling our colonies and the consideration that the slaves we buy were in the same condition in Africa, either hereditary or taken in war. In other words, imperial priorities and the fact of pre-existing African slavery did justify uh, the slave trade. Now the priority of British geopolitical interests remained a consistent principle throughout Burke's career. We can see this in the speech he made on the African slave trade on the 5th of June, uh, 1777, in which he defended the company of merchant adventurers trading to Africa, a company, against the charges, against charges of corruption. So debate in the House of Commons, and during the debate, an MP named David Hartley, uh, who was a reformer and a sympathizer with the American colonists, this is the moment, the time of the American Revolution, Hartley rose to denounce the barbarity of transatlantic slavery. And he pulled out of his pocket a pair of handcuffs used on slave ships. Trying them on, Edmund Burke agreed that the Commons should consider whether the slave trade might somehow be softened, as he put it. And then he added, Africa, time out of mind, had been in a state of slavery. Therefore, the inhabitants only changed one species of slavery for another. It was a bizarre moment. Um, it was an image um, designed for our very unforgiving, hypervisual, virtual news cycle. The London Evening Post remarked that Burke, I quote, as an advocate for liberty, appeared somewhat awkward in the fetters, which he actually put on, as well as in the defence of the use of them. And perhaps the image of an uncomfortable Burke shackling himself in the British House of Commons 
also provides um, a suitable conclusion to my talk. So my theme um, then has been a conspicuous silence, uh, a contradiction or a blind spot in the European response to the transportation of enslaved Africans to the American colonies. I'm not confident that any of those terms um, adequately captures what I really want to illuminate. What interests me is a kind of structural blindness to the slave trade. Um, a structural blindness that I think has often been replicated by historians rather than challenged by them. The inconsistencies in the writings of Locke, with which I began, um, were generally regarded by earlier scholars as embarrassing lapses was aberrations with no real significance for his political theory. I don't think that's good enough because the persistence of racial inequality into the present has prompted claims that Western ideas of liberty have been encoded right from the beginning in ways that restrict full political personhood to white Europeans. More recently, um, some historians have perhaps run to the opposite extreme and so whiteness is um, sometimes now made a defining feature of the political works of the Enlightenment, um, an organizing principle of the Western liberal tradition. I'm not sure that's right either. Ultimately, my preference has been for a rather more conventional approach. What I've been trying to do um, today is to bring greater richness of detail and perhaps some analytical precision to the writings of three Irish men, all of whom have at various times been hailed as critics of imperialism. And as I've tried to show, at least on the subject of transatlantic slavery, this reputation has not always been deserved. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>